Okay, I think we might uh, start uh, the seminar. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so, good morning to all our participants in Australia and the Asia Pacific region. Uh, good evening to our audience in the Americas. And if we have any listeners in Europe, uh, good on you. <laughs> so, welcome to this month's installment of our Matrix online seminar. Um, so, my name is Peter Bauknecht. I'm one of the deputy directors of Matrix. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce my good friend and collaborator, Professor Matthai Varghese. Uh, I'm not hearing anything, so I hope you can all hear me. Anyway, I'll just continue. So Matthai, uh, I think needs little introduction, certainly here in Australia. But for those of you who don't know him, just a quick summary. Um, so Matthai is currently the Elder Professor of Mathematics and ARC Laureate Fellow at at the University of Adelaide. Um, so Matthai is fellow of the Australian Mathematical Society, the Australian Academy of Science, and the Royal Society of South Australia. He is also a recipient of the Ostamas Medal, and earlier this year was awarded the Hannan Medal, which is a career award from the Australian Academy of Science. Um, so as a bit of history, Matthai did his PhD at MIT in 86 on the supervision of Daniel Quillen, and I guess his PhD work, um, which is known as the Methi Quillen formalism, is, is one of his claims to fame and is still widely used in both mathematics and physics. So after his PhD, he was a postdoc at the University of Chicago for a couple of years, and he has been at the University of Adelaide since 1989, um, except for some periods of extended leave. And during one of those periods, he was a Clay Senior Research Scholar at MIT, and that was during the 2000-2001 academic year. I think that's where the seeds were planted for his long-term collaboration uh, with Richard Melrose and the late Isidore Singer on projective families index theory, which is the subject of today's talk. Um, so I guess uh, Singer doesn't really need a big introduction. Uh, as, as you all know, he was together with Sir Michael Atia, one of the grandfathers of index theory uh, which is a subject which had and continues to have an enormous impact on mathematics as well as physics and is widely considered to be one of the major achievements in mathematics of the 20th century. So sadly both Singer and Atia passed away recently and I think this talk can be considered sort of a uh, tribute to, uh, to both of them. Um, so before I hand over to the speaker just some uh, uh, housekeeping issues, uh, the slide is on. Um, so this talk will be recorded. Uh, the idea is that the talk will process uh, progress without questions and that questions can be raised at the end of the talk after about 45 minutes by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of, your, bottom of your screen. And then we'll, uh, the speaker will try to answer as many of the questions that, uh, that he can. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, let me hand over to Matthai Varghese for his talk on Index Theorem of Projective Families of Elliptic Operators. Um, so my talk is on the Index Theorem for Projective Families of Elliptic Operators. And so, so it's based on uh, some work with uh, Richard Melrose and Isidore Singer uh, which was uh, about seven years ago or 12 years ago and some work in progress which is uh, inspired by this uh, earlier work and which we are going to dedicate to Singer. So as Peter said, I mean, uh, Isdor Singer was a great mathematician and one of the co-inventors of index theory. And he uh, is well known for the Tiersinger index theorems the revolutionizing geometric analysis, the Racinger analytic torsion, and the Racinger conjectures. And probably uh, most importantly, the uh, bridging of mathematics and physics uh, quantum field theory, gate theory, string theory, where he introduced many uh, sophisticated mathematics to these areas. 
On a personal note, I am greatly indebted to a singer who passed away earlier this year. And he invited me to spend the year 2000-2001 at MIT uh, <laughs> with the help of a clay research fellowship for a year. We commenced uh, together with Richard Melrose an intense collaboration on generalizations of the TSing index theorem to this projective case. And I'll talk about one such result today. So uh, Singer was a great uh, mentor and friend, and I want to dedicate this lecture to his memory. So I'll start with uh, just a review of the, a brief review of the Tia Singer index theorem, uh, just in case there are people who are not that familiar with it. So we start off with a compact manifold and V a vector bundle over it. And the symbol psi of ZV is the filtered algebra of uh, classical pseudo-differential operators on Z. I'll, I'll talk about uh, this a bit in the next uh, few slides. So the elliptic uh, <clears throat> elements of this, uh, which I'll explain later on, are known to be Fred home operators and therefore have an index, which is an integer, which is the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the co-kernel. And in the 1960s, uh, Tia and Singer proved their famous theorem, which is uh, giving a topological formula for the index of such an elliptic uh, pseudo-differential operator. It's uh, <laughs> some characteristic class on the tangent bundle, where it's the term character, the symbol of D. Right? And here they are uh, receiving the Arbor Prize in 2004, I think. So <laughs> a differential operator P on an open set omega in Euclidean space is, uh, <laughs> is a sum A alpha of D and DX alpha, where alpha is a multi-index and the length of this multi-index is less than or equal to M and A alpha is a smooth uh, function on omega. The full symbol of P is just uh, <coughs> is sigma of P at X and Psi. Uh, where Psi is a, a vector variable and it's just A alpha Psi to raise to alpha. And the principal symbol of P is the top order term. So namely those, uh, the sum over of the right-hand side over the, uh, which is of the top degree. And P is elliptic if this top order symbol is invertible when this variable C is not zero. Uh, oh, it works. Uh, using the Fourier transform composed with the inverse Fourier transform one has an oscillatory integral representation for u, uh, a compactly supported function on omega. So p u of x is some universal constant and you have this exponential e to the i x minus y dot psi, this is kind of like the Fourier transform variable. And you have sigma, the symbol, and u of y dy d psi. And a pseudo differential operator P. So I write this uh, differential operator in this complicated way because it easily generalizes to a pseudo differential operator. So <laughs> it's uh, now the only difference is the symbol has an asymptotic expansion. So it's got an infinite tail. Uh, but it's got a highest order term and it doesn't stop at a zeroth order, but it has negative order also. So <laughs> each, uh, each term here is homogeneous of this order, n minus k, and for t positive, 
And this is a symbol of order m minus j. So that means that if you differentiate in x, you don't change uh, the order, but if you differentiate in psi, you do reduce it. The principal symbol is the top degree term as before, and the ellipticity is defined as before, namely this uh, top order symbol is invertible for psi not equal to zero. So it turns out, although I've done this in Euclidean space, it turns out that all this also makes sense for compact manifolds Z and a vector bundle V over Z. And the notation is uh, this uh, pseudo differential operators on Z with values in V, and this is the symbol. So the symbol is now uh, sections of the anamorphism bundle of V over the cotangent bundle. So this is, uh, <laughs> so Achi and Singer generalized the index theorem to families as follows. You first consider the case of a smooth map from the base manifold X to uh, pseudo differential operators on Z. And this gives a smooth family of pseudo differential operators on Z parameterized by X. But it turns out to be, uh, there's a natural generalization of this. You can consider a fiber bundle of compact manifolds. So Z goes to Y goes to X. So it's a kind of, uh, the families are twisted sections. So twisted maps. And now V is a vector bundle over the total space Y. And let's say Z be uh, the filtered algebra bundle or X with typical fiber pseudo differential operators on Z uh, acting on B restricted to Z. Okay, so this is the uh, generalization. And that uh, fiber bundle gives rise to a bundle of uh, pseudo differential operators. And since the fiber bundle is locally trivial, it turns out that, so you can use the local trivialization to get a local trivialization of the bundle of pseudo differential operators. And the structure group is essentially a diffeomorphism group of Z, or since it's got coefficients in V, it's the automorphisms of uh, the vector bundle. So if D is an elliptic section of this algebra of uh, filtered algebra of pseudo differential operator, bundle of pseudo differential operator, then Atiyah and Singer showed that the analytic index, so as we know that the set, is an element of the K theory of X because uh, on each fiber, it's an elliptic operator. So it's, uh, it consists of two uh, vector spaces, the kernel and the co-kernel. And as you vary along X, you get uh, a pair of vector bundles over X. That's not strictly true because you could have jumps. So you have to do a procedure called stabilization. Then you get a pair of vector bundles and an element in K theory. And they also define the topological index, which is expressed in terms of the topology of the fiber bundle the vector bundle V and the symbol of the operator. So <clears throat> that here Singer index theorem for families says that the analytic index of D is equal to the topological index of D and they're both in the K theory of X. So it's a vast generalization of the index theory theorem for a single operator and it turns out to be have uh, a lot more applications. So now I want to talk uh, <laughs> about projective index theory. So the dixmere dude so I start off with dixmere dude theory. It asserts that isomorphism classes of locally trivial bundles, Kp, with five of the compact operators, K, and structure group, the projective unitary group. So this is the projective unitary group in infinite dimensions. And bijective correspondence with 
the third integral cohomology of x. So I won't go through the proof even though I've written it here uh, because I've, <laughs> I realize I'm running out of time. So, uh, <laughs> and then the twisted k theory of x, well, the twisted k theory was defined by Jonathan Rosenberg as the k theory of the algebra of continuous sections of this uh, bundle kp. So the twisted k theory uh, will sometimes be denoted by k theory of xh, where h is the dixme the class of this bundle of compact operators. It turns out to be a module or the k theory of x and has nice uh, functorial properties. Uh, an equivalent and important description of twisted k theory is uh, as homotopy classes of continuous sections of uh, an associated bundle of Fredholm operators. So you take p, which is a principal pu bundle, and you take the product with the Fredholm operators and you divide by the projective unitary group where this acts on the right on p and it, uh, pu acts on the Fredholm operators by conjugation. So this is a, <coughs> This is a bundle or X and a continuous section of Fred P is a projective family of Fred Ohm operators. Okay, so So in a Tia Singer index theory, we don't want to deal directly with Fred Ohm operators, but if we want to uh, replace Fredholm operators by elliptic pseudo differential operators and compact operators by smoothing operators. Uh, there turns out to be a new difficulty here because uh, the projective unitary group does not preserve the smoothing operators. So, because <laughs> uh, so with Singer we uh, we prove the index theorem, projective index theorem whenever the dixmey uh, invariant is a decomposable class. Uh, and I will mention this uh, today, but there are and many uh, such decomposable classes are non-torsion and hence infinite dimensional. And so I'll set up uh, a general and natural index theorem for projective families of elliptic operators and show <coughs> the decomposable dixmey dude invariants uh, fit into this. And <coughs> so, some more new, newer stuff is, uh, so it's the work with Marrows, which is in progress, is we show that hyperbolic three manifolds also fit into the setup, even though uh, the volume forms are not decomposable and there are some three manifolds which do not satisfy the above and many others which do. Okay, so, so here's the general setup. So again, it's like the family's index, uh, something happened. Lost my screen. Ah, oh, here. <coughs> so this is just like the Achille Singer families index. So again, on Y, we have a vector bundle over Y. And, but here is some new data. You have a primitive line bundle J over the fiber product of Y with itself, and that's Y cross Y over X. So it's pairs of points with predict to the same point in X. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this fiber product of Y with itself is another fiber bundle over x with fiber z cross z. 
So it sort of doubles the fiber. And permittivity means under the lifting by the three projection maps. So if you go to Y3, the three projection maps to Y2, there's a natural isomorphism of uh, J when you pull it back on the pi S and J when you pull it back on the pi F. This is isomorphic to J pulled back on the pi C, the center one. And so uh, this data is sometimes called a uh, bundle gerb. Uh, so Michael Murray studied this a lot. So what happens is this allows, endows the space of sections. So J is a line bundle over Y squared, which is, uh, uh, has this primitive property, but the primitive property says that this space of sections has a fiber-wise product. So this is not true for any line bundle, but it's true for these primitive ones. And the fibers are isomorphic to uh, smoothing operators on the typical fiber Z. So the smooth as a Maya bundle is then realized in terms of its space of sections. So smooth sections of A is just uh, smooth sections of J over Y squared. So the dictionary do the invariant. Uh, so that's the degree three class. And it turns out that if you lift it to be a phi, right, it's a zero in cohomology. So phi up star of this uh, bundle A, this bundle of smoothing operators is trivializable. And part of the data is a choice of this trivialization, which we call kappa. So now I'll define the bundle, projective bundle of pseudo differential operators by uh, following the definition of the Azumaya bundle. So now uh, this bundle E over Y, so that's part of the data of the projective family. So you look at the projective pseudo differential operators of order L, so along the fibers of the fiber bundle Y uh, <coughs> with coefficients A tensor E. And this consists of uh, distributions on Y squared, right, which are uh, conormal. So what this means is uh, uh, you take uh, distributions and you hit it with uh, vector fields which are tangent to the fiber-wise diagonal. And so distributions are in some sobola space, but if you hit it with vector fields which are tangent to the fiber-wise diagonal, then you don't change the order, the Sobolev order. So it's, it's stable under such uh, vector fields. And these are called conormal distributions. They have the property that the singular support is on the fiber bus diagonal. And actually the wavefront set is, on, is, co is uh, in the conormal bundle. So it follows from the standard case, there's a symbol map So the symbol map takes pseudo differential operators with values in A to uh, sections of the bundle E lifted to the cosphere bundle and turns out with NL. NL is the uh, is a line bundle with uh, homogeneity L. So keeping track of uh, the degree. And J disappears here because uh, by the definition of J, the line bundle J, its restriction to the fiber diagonal is canonically trivial. So the element into K theory determined by the symbol of a projective family 
of pseudo differential operators is as such it's e plus e minus well lifted to the cosphere bundle and the symbol so it's in k the k theory k1 of the cosphere bundle which is the compactly supported k theory of the cotangent bundle the along the fibers so the principal symbol map so that's is invariant under conjugation and is well defined independent of the trivialization uh, and so on and the usual composition properties of pseudo differential operators extend without difficulties as do the symbolic properties so <laughs> So the space of pseudo differential operators form graded module under composition and the principal symbol map is independent of the trivialization and gives the multiplicative short exact sequence pseudo differential operators of order L minus one injects to pseudo differential operators of order L and this uh, subjects to uh, the symbol space. So the next sort of business is to define the analytic index. Uh, <laughs> fixing the trivialization kappa, the symbol of a projective family of pseudo differential operators, determines an element in the compactly supported K theory of the fiber wise cotangent bundle. <laughs> we now show that the index of such a family is an element in the twisted K theory of the base. So here, twisted K theory is denoted by the algebra, which is more precise than just looking at the Dixmay do the uh, invariant of the algebra. So more precisely, let P be a pseudo differential operator of order M, uh, uh, I mean a projective family of pseudo differential operators. And, and, and we assume that it's elliptic so that uh, the symbol is invertible away from the zero section. So, and by a standard construction, P has a parametric skew, which is of order minus M and one minus QP and one minus PQ are smoothing operators. So the index is realized by using this, the following item potent, you take one minus S zero squared so S0 is the difference of one uh, minus QP and S1 is the difference of one minus uh, PQ. So, and the orthogonal terms are a little bit more complicated. It's Q S1 plus S1 squared and S1 P. So it's a two by two matrix with values, uh, with entries in smoothing operators. So the usual, <laughs> so the analytic index is defined in terms of E1, this item potent E1, minus a kind of trivial item potent, which is one uh, on this slot and zeros everywhere else. So this difference is uh, defines an element in K theory of smoothing operators, and that's the analytic index. Well, I said it would be in K theory of uh, the twisted uh, K theory of X. So there's a uh, one more argument which uh, says that this is the same thing. So the analytic index uh, is in the twist K theory of A. That's because uh, the smooth sections of uh, of A over X is smoothing operators along the fibers. And so it uses the Morita equivalence to see that these two are the same. Okay, so the K theory is invariant on the Morita equivalence. So the analytic index uh, <coughs> maps compact the symbols, which is the compactly supported K theory of the cotangent, fiberwise cotangent bundle. And, and maps it to the twisted K theory of the base. 
So to show that uh, this map is fixed, we have to check homotopy invariance, invariance on the bundle isomorphism and stability, and we show all this, right? Uh, so a particular case of interest uh, arises from uh, projective families of uh, twisted Dirac operators. So let me just uh, define these. So you see, uh, one of the uh, things about projective index theory is that it's uh, awkward to define the operators themselves, but it's more natural to define the short kernels. So I'll define projective families Dirac operators in terms of the distribution of kernels. So you take a Dirac delta distributional section over the fiber product of Y with itself. And this is supported on the fiber wise diagonal. Right, so this is some direct delta function and we can, <laughs> it acts on uh, the endomorphisms of spinners. And you can look at the unitary Clifford connection acting on the left variables. So that's uh, nabla SL and nabla J's connection on J, which is compatible with the primitive property of J. Then you can form the connection one tends uh, the connection on the Clifford algebra plus the connection on J tends a one. So this is, uh, is also a connection and it acts on the direct uh, delta distribution. And um, And the composition with the contraction given by Clifford modification, right, represents the short kernel of the projective family of Dirac operators. So, uh, so this gives, uh, in the usual case, the actual uh, family of Dirac operators along the fibers, but we define it uh, using short kernels because we are doing the projective case. Uh, if you want to define it directly in terms of operators, you can only do it locally. So this is much more elegant because it's global. So the index theorem that we prove is that uh, the analytic index is equal to the topological index, which is in the twisted K theory of A, a uh, twisted K theory of X. So it generalizes, uh, it reduces to the Tiersinger family's index. And I'll just uh, <clears throat> mention the, uh, actually, maybe I don't have time to mention the decomposable example. Uh, let me just go on to the, so the hyperbolic three manifold example, because this is a new example. So it turns out there are many examples of closed hyperbolic three manifolds with vanishing first Betty number. So if the first Betty number vanishes, the volume form cannot be uh, decomposable. So it doesn't fall into the example, which I didn't discuss, but which is in the literature. For example, most Dane fillings uh, <coughs> of not complements will have this property more precisely, if K is a knot in the three sphere, which is not a torus knot or satellite knot, then the complement uh, S3 minus K has a complete hyperbolic structure of finite volume by the work of Thurston. And one can do PQ Dane fillings on M. So attaching a solid torus, which is P times meridian plus Q times the longitude that bonds the disk and PQ the incorporate integers and this gives a manifold with the uh, first homology being torsion. And this will be hyperbolic for all but a finite number of choices of P and Q by Thurston's uh, hyperbolic Dane-Filling theorem. So in fact, for many choices of K and almost all choices of N, one sub N Dane-Filling will give a hyperbolic homology three sphere. 
So these will never be uh, have volume forms which are decomposable. However, we can still uh, produce a well, we can still prove an index theorem for such manifolds. So we use the following. There's a conjecture of Thurston this, that says that any compact three hyperbolic three manifold M has a finite cover M hat with a non-zero first Betty number. So this conjecture was proved by Egel in 2012. So we'll use the solution, we'll use just the conjecture, which is now, is now a theorem. We argue that M hat has a decomposable volume form. So let A be a closed one form on M hat such that the cohomology class of A is, <coughs> is a generator of H1. So because it has non-zero first Betty number. And since M is compact, by Poincaré duality, there's a close two form B whose uh, cohomology class is non-zero and is a generator of H2. So A wedge B is uh, a volume on M hat. So the volume is a generator of H3 of M hat with integer coefficients. So, so M hat is now decomposable. The volume is decomposable and we can uh, essentially do uh, index theory there and it works. So, so there is a fiber bundle over M hat with typical fiber Z and uh, the left of the volume form of M hat is exact on, uh, on the total space X. So everything works nicely for M hat, but M hat is not the manifold we want to consider. We want to look at M. So let Lambda be the finite cover of M with fiber the finite group G. And for each element gamma in G, consider the pullback bundle, uh, pullback bundle job, which is, uh, so LX is the bundle job over M hat. And the, this is the pullback bundle job. It has Dixmere duty in the uh, gamma star of A wedge B. And consider the product of the bundle jobs pull back under the various elements in uh, the group G. And this there's a, a fiber product or M hat. This is the product of bundle jobs. It's Dixmere Dure invariant is the sum of these elements, which is invariant under G. So it descends to be uh, the the number of elements in G times the volume of M. So we do get a finite dimensional bundle job, but uh, it sticks me to the invariant is uh, the, the wrong thing. It's too large. It's uh, the number of elements in G times volume of M, but uh, we can fix this as follows. First of all, we use the construction above to get a fiber bundle, which is the, you take X and take the fiber product over M of X and gamma star X and do this for each element gamma in G. And uh, so this is the total space of the fiber bundle whose Dixway Dure invariant is uh, size of G times volume of M. This implies that G times uh, the pullback of the volume of M is trivial, where P1 is the projection map from X1 to M. And uh, what happened here? Yeah, so, so it follows that uh, P1 
the pullback of the volume form is a torsion class. So there is a principal uh, finite dimensional uh, PUK bundle, T over X1, whose Dixmay do the invariant is equal to this torsion class. Then the composition of P1 and Q so gives a bundle job with Dixmay do the invariant equal to volume of M. Right, so we've fixed, uh, we've gone rid of the multiple, right? The argument is completed by the following lemma, which says that if you have a finite dimensional compact uh, fiber bundle and suppose that delta is a degree three class on M such that the lift of delta to the total space F is zero, then F is a bundle job. So this is a simple exercise. And with this, we conclude that any compact hyperbolic three manifold has a finite dimensional bundle job with Dixmay and Duda invariant equal to the K times the volume for any K in uh, an integer. And we can apply our projective index theorem to this. So I'll just end uh, quickly. I think I've run out of time, but uh, I'll just give this non-example. So supposing G is a finite group acting freely on the three sphere, then the quotient of S3 and G does not have a finite dimensional bundle job. And one can prove this by contradiction. So supposing LX is a finite dimensional bundle job or S3 quotient is out by G and P is the projection map then we can lift this bundle job to be a bundle, finite dimension bundle job over the three sphere. But the main result in uh, a paper by Murray and Stevenson in 2011 implies that there are no finite dimensional bundle jobs over the three sphere. And hence we get a contradiction. Uh, so, and I wanted to talk about other examples of so three manifolds which had finite dimensional bundle gel, but I've run out of time. So I think I'll end here. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Mathai. Uh, on behalf of all the uh, participants, thank you so much for, uh, for a very nice talk. I don't think the applause button uh, is activated. So, uh, so you'll just get uh, Thank you for me, but um, I don't see any Q&A questions yet. So to give people a chance to type in their question, let me just ask you a very general question. <laughs> um, so regarding applications, so um, of course the uh, traditional Atayas Singer index theorem has lots of applications in quantum field theory. It's very closely related to anomalies in quantum field theory and can be used very effectively to find obstructions to the existence of quantum field theories. Mm -hmm. um, is there any such application here that you can think of? I mean, is, is this index theory for projective families giving rise to some conditions on certain quantum field theories or? Well, it hasn't been explored, but you know, as far as I understand, uh, the anomalies uh, correspond to like, uh, families of Dirac operators, whether they have a section, the determinant line, right? And yeah. there is an anal analogous construction here, uh, but I haven't explored it with respect to any quantum field theory. I don't know if there exists one, but there is an analog. I just uh, don't know if it's a real quantum field theory or not. <laughs> Thank you. Um... I still don't see any questions. Uh, can you open the Q&A window and see whether you can see any questions or? Uh, actually, I don't know how, so I have to stop sharing, I think. No, I don't see any questions. Okay. Um, so if anybody wants to ask a question, then uh, quickly type in that you're planning to- uh, oh, There are some things in chat. Yeah, that, that this question shouldn't appear in chat, but... Uh, uh, no, no, there are no questions there also, so... Yeah. Well... 
maybe I went too fast. Uh, I, there's a question for me. Will you come back on screen? Well, I, I think I'm back on screen because I can see myself. <laughs> and I, um, I, I started the video again. Okay, well, if there's no questions, then, uh, I mean, if people uh, can think of a silly question after the talk, then, of course, they are welcome to uh, contact you directly. Um, also, the, this talk was recorded, so uh, a link to the recording will be, uh, will be sent around uh, probably later today. And again, I'd like to uh, thank all of you to, uh, for attending this talk. And uh, I'd like to thank in particular Matthai again for, uh, for this fantastic talk.